Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Flying Cat Marketing interview series. Today, I'm really excited to speak to Stuart Townsend, who's the co-founder uh, of Podcast Hawk, and also works as a channel as a, a channel as a service consultant, which is what we're going to be talking about today. The topic of today is SaaS channel remarketing: how B two B SaaS companies can market through resellers. Hello, Perfect. Stuart. Hello, thank you. Thanks for the invite for coming on the show. Awesome. Absolutely. I think uh, we haven't talked about this topic before yet on the podcast, and it's pretty interesting. It's something that I actually don't hear, I haven't heard so much about, so I'm really excited to dive into it and uh, hear your case study as well. So before we get too much into it, what does it actually mean? What What is channel remarketing, first of yeah. all? Uh, <clears throat> channel is, is a term that's used really loosely across every company. Um, but in its purest form, think of it as when you go to the grocers or to a supermarket, they've purchased them products from somewhere else. They've purchased it from a channel. So it's the same whether you're selling physical products or software products. It literally is rather than you directly selling yourself, you're selling your product through a third party. That's the easiest way to explain it. In, in its basic format without taking okay. hours and boring people. So it's like white labeling in a way. It, um, it could be seen as that, but, but in a sense, yeah, we could go down a rabbit hole with that. So it's, it's not essentially in the purest term of um, marketing a product through a third party and a reseller, a reseller is actually taking that product and buying it at a discount off you and then reselling it on. So a hundred dollars product, they'll buy it 70 and sell it a hundred, wrap some services around it or something else. Whereas a white label is they're buying it off you at a set price, put a skin around it and they are still reselling it. Um, but not, not in the sense of what we're talking about today. Okay. Gotcha. So you talk a lot about B2B SaaS companies fully leveraging channel remarketing as a model, as a business model, I think you mean. What what does yeah. that mean to, to use that as the full business model? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> if you're a B2B SaaS company <clears throat> and you want to grow and you want to grow quickly, there's two ways to do it. One, get a load of money, hire a load of people, get loads of people to do marketing for you, and away you go. Um, in, in the world that I live in and talk about is you're going through other companies. So think, um, again, how did Microsoft sell their products? 95% of Microsoft products go through uh, a marketing reselling channel. They go through third parties and they could be really well-known companies or companies you've never heard of. Um, but they take Office 365 or whatever it may be, and then they sell it with other services and they market it out to their customers. Um, so rather than again, hire direct salespeople, ramp them all up and get inbound leads from marketing and do all that standard stuff. You can accelerate your sales by going through a third party. who have already got a customer base. Um, they've already got that reach. They've already got a marketing program so they can take that product out for you really quickly. And in return, you pay them some margin. Like I say, they buy at 70, they sell at a hundred. So why, why would I want to do this as a, as a SaaS founder? Is it because I don't have, I don't want to build up an internal marketing team or? There's, there's a couple of different sort of variations on that. So it could be, you still want to grow your marketing team, but you want to accelerate quickly in your, um, let's use ge ge geography as, as a good base point. So you're based in the US, you want to come to Europe. Most SaaS, B2B SaaS companies go, right, okay, we'll base ourselves in London or Berlin or whatever it is. Um, and they put, what term, boots on the ground, set up a sales team, set up a marketing team, set up operations. Um, but they've not proved that market. It may be that that particular product doesn't sell very well in, in a country. So rather than do that, why don't you test it out initially and then invest afterwards? So find some partners uh, again, in countries that you want to have boots on the ground on. Or it could be actually you want to break into Israel as a market. Again, Israel is a very um, relationship-led sale, sales model. You can't have people in the US or London talking to people in Israel just 
doesn't work. Uh, same again with Southern Europe, you know, it's a very relationship led, um, sales cycle. So again, channel partners, they know their market, they know their location, they know their culture, they can take it out really quickly. So it helps with all those sort of activities. Um, and also again, if you're limited on services, you want to sell your products and you need services. Do you hire a load of people in different territories to cover that, that can speak the language and deliver, or do you get third party partners um, to do that for you? That's sort of the use cases and scenarios that we typically deal in sort of, um, work across. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's, it's instead of localizing my sales team, let's find a local company who yeah. can do that for us. And I guess it sounds at the end, even if you're just paying them a margin, it's still a better cost than hiring an entire boots on the ground team over there. Exactly. Yeah. Don't have the relationships yet. Yeah. They don't have the relationships, but also that could really fall flat because again, that product just may not fit that market. Um, so it helps give you product market fit testing, um, and capabilities around that before you then seriously invest in offices and people and the standard sort of stuff. Are there companies when they're leveraging this as a full model, full marketing channel, the, I guess, there's more and more, um, do, are you also using other marketing channels? Oh, sorry. I was interrupting you then. <laughs> um, so in terms of um, other companies will be using this. Yeah, most definitely, um, as one channel, but also going through different marketing channels as well. So they would be leveraging their resellers to sell for them. They would also have direct marketing and inbound leads and those sort of activities. And also they may have a model where again, they've got a marketing team. They've got too many leads coming in for a geography or for a particular product that they may, may deem is volume or a low ticket item and they pass them out to resellers um, around that sort of side. So it's like, we've got a hundred leads in, you know, our team can't cope with that or the very low ticket items. We help resellers pass them back to them. They'll go market to those customers and move them forward. Yeah. So it can be bi-directional. It can be supportive of the marketing team themselves. If again, if they've got activities that they can't, um, uh, support too much. Love it. So let's talk about your case study. You worked with Zendesk in a channel remarketing strategy. Uh, what were the initial problems that you faced that made you think that remarketing was the, or working with resellers was, was the, the way to go? Um, yeah, so I joined Zendesk when there was, I think it was about 200, 250 people low, uh, globally. <clears throat> and it was pre-IPO before they went on the stock market. Uh, and I was brought in to build out a channel program across Europe to, again, do some of the things that I've just talked about, expand the company's customer um, service software into markets where we were struggling in direct um, around that. And and the problem and challenges were were internal <laughs> in a sense of trying to get the resources together and get the materials and put a program and a structure together, but also, um, educate people internally, what channel meant all of a sudden it was like anything that was outside of direct sales, people threw on my desk, a white label. Oh, that's Stuart affiliate. That's Stuart. Um, so there's lots of those sort of things, um, coming on board those internal challenges. But I think, you know, initially it was actually doing the research and understanding who was the right channel for Zendesk to be sold through. Um, so I experimented with a couple of things. One was we went through the Magento market, spent a lot of time there, but again, they were selling high ticket items where Zendesk at the time was, I think it's like $29 a seat. So there was no interest to them. There was not enough money in there. There was not enough margin in there around that. So it was a baptism of fire in a sense of trying to understand what sort of challenges, where can this product be sold? What's the countries it can be sold to and where can we, where, well, where, where can I get a quick enough return a to make sure I keep my job and B to keep all the other people away that keep throwing other stuff at me. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this resale stuff. That's going really well. We don't need to do these other things that you think is all magic sort of stuff. So yeah, it takes, <laughs> takes a bit of time to get going. It took about 12 months to get there, um, around that. And that's a typical sort of use case for a return on a, a, a true B2B, um, marketing program going through resellers, et cetera, is anywhere from 24 to 36 months. 
It's not it's not a short term fix. You're either in it or not. Okay. Um so before you started when you started when you decided which resellers you were finally going to go with after your lesson with Magento, what was your hypothesis? What what did you say? How do how can you best select a reseller and what was your strategy there? <clears throat> Excuse me. It came back to I think it's like uh, with any sort of B2B SaaS product and when you go out and do market, it's about product market fit. And I put a, a, a similar model there in play around that. So it was like, well, where will Zendesk fit as a product and not be competitive? And where will it help other partners sell um, that product alongside their products? Uh, and so I went out to the market and I looked at obviously what the competitors were doing like Salesforce and ServiceNow. These are the larger companies at the time. Um, because again, Zendesk was a small brand. It's not what it is today. It's, you know, thousands of people today, it's 250 people. And we've just seen as this cool company that was actually from Northern, from Europe, but oddly enough in San Francisco. Um, so it was, it was that market research and going out there and talking to so many partners to understand, and this is a typical sort of thing in channel is talk to partners and understand, is it complementary? And the most receptive marketplace was Google. Google has got a really large, um, channel. That's how it, it sells its products predominantly. So it was them and it was people that were selling. It's called Google Workspace at the time now, but it was um, Google email and drive and such. It wasn't a, such a mature market. And there's only so many seats you can sell of Google email and drive and such before you start to run out of services or other products. So Zendesk was complementary in terms of a, some of those users that had email were using it for customer service. So we could move those over. Um, but also the, we, um, having processes and automations that they were trying to build and pain points in there as well. So the reseller could then sell Zendesk with services into those customers. So it was a great market fit. It was like, right. Okay. Now, how do we actually go out? Well, Google at the time, a really good joint go to market initiative. So we could go and work with Google and Zendesk together with those partners with, um, what we term market development fund, MDF fund. So it helped support those marketing messages and those initiatives. Cause again, Google didn't have a customer service platform, so we weren't competitive. So it was, it was around that aspect and, and that was a great result. Um, and it makes it sound like it took five minutes, but I talked to other partners at the time, other ones that had worked in the Salesforce environment and service now and such, and they just didn't work for Zendesk at the time because we didn't have the functionality. We were too small, um, for what we did, uh, around that. But yeah, it was lots, lots of conversations and it came back to a sort of channel market fit methodology, um, around that sort of side of mm -hmm. things. But yeah. Looking at the other side, the reseller what do they typically look for in a partner how how are they making those decisions um so there's a couple of well there's, there's multiple things one is are you going to go out of business next week or actually you've been around a bit and, and you're stable um but it's whether you're complementary so you've got to think these resellers because that could have anywhere from two or three products to 20 or 30 or hundreds of products that a, they're contracted to sell, but they don't actually sell all of those products. They, they focus on some. So it's always about, can you bring me a, a product that's complementary to my offering that I can then go and sell out and take out further? Right. Okay. So that's one tick in the box. The other is services. Can you actually bring me a product that I can sell human being time to my customers? and make more revenue because I'm not really going to make a lot on the licenses side of things. Um, mm -hmm. and then thirdly is, am I first to market resellers love that if they're one of the sort of first sort of partners that you're bringing on board, they know that you're going to do so much for them to make them successful. So they're always sort of looking for that aspect of, will you pass me leads back? Is there a marketing initiative we can do together? Do you have the supporting material? etc um, around that do you have training enablement that sort of thing so again with with the zendesk methodology what i did with that is you know we we had limited i know it seems 
crazy we had millions of dollars but we had limited marketing resources <laughs> um so we uh, me and the marketing chap used to hustle so literally if i got new partners i would bring them into our um salesperson onboarding so zendesh ran onboarding every month and we'd bring them into the office and they would be onboarded if they were a salesperson of zendesk so they got their training there and they enablement there and again partners are looking for those sort of things it's like are you going to bring me into the company as part of the company or are you just going to treat me as an external party and not really mm -hmm. do anything with me so it's it's making them feel part of the family that this is a long-term relationship they're going to be successful and make some money because you've got to think of this as a you know from from your audience's perspective you're trying to get a third party to sell your product they've got to invest time and effort and money into that marketing program and those initiatives to do that they're not just doing it out of love um, around that and it takes mm -hmm. a lot of time so they don't make these decisions very quickly and and the light ships they take quite a bit of time to move but once you've got them on board i'm still talking to partners now that i brought on board in zendesk five years ago um, i'm going out to malta later on this year to go and have some drinks and socialize with one of them that again when i set up with him i think he was he was less than 10 people now he's about 50. um so it's it is a long-term thing it's it's not it's not a it's not a, a short-term win yeah what what is i was gonna say what are the expectations of the not the reseller but the product on your end for example as the channel remarketer um, I want to ask what are the expectations, but really I want to phrase it as what should you bring to the table to make this kind of relationship successful? Uh, that's a good one. I think sort of it anchors back to, uh, again, I suppose what we're just talking about there is that, that long-term capability that you're going to deliver to that partner um, around that side, but also internally as an organization, no matter whether you're five people 10 people 100 or a thousand you've got to bring to that partner and any of these activities buy-in internally and i'll explain that a little bit more because a, a lot of people see channel as just um bag carriers or you know some old terms from corporate land um but what you need to bring is ceo cfo whatever level or marketing or sales are all bought into it and get it because once you've got that and the partner comes in and understands who you are and working with you etc it just makes life so much easier um if there's negativity we we'll use that term if there's negativity and sort of friction it just won't work and and i'll put that into in, into a, a sort of a reference point in terms of if if you as a b2b SaaS company haven't truly bought into this and you decide oh we're doing a product launch great okay we're going live in june this year and we're going to do all these new features and it's awesome um and you're not thinking about telling your partners to be part of that there's a problem because otherwise what can happen is you go launch and their customers tell them that you've gone live with a new product and they find last that's just the end of the world um so it has to be that buy-in there has to be that thinking that that channel partner is part of the organization not an extension not a, a third party they're not just an extension of the organization mm -hmm. so uh, how is it different from products that are your partners integration partners or those kind of things it, it's i get the logistics that they're actually just reselling the product but um for example if you have a lot of different partners or they're reselling similar products to yours is that a thing uh it can be but that would be more of a distributor who would um take a portfolio of hundreds of thousands of products and then sell them down into a into a reseller who would then sell them onwards um but also again we've not really sort of touched upon it is as a b2b SaaS company you can have integrations or integration partners so relationships with that and you can have cross sell where they resell it so it's like i built my product it's really great i've got this little marketplace i'm going to integrate with xyz um, so you can have that commercial relationship where you're both pushing each other's products around that uh, and selling it onwards and that does happen that's happening more now not so much marketplaces but you've seen the value of um 
a Zendesk with X or, or you know, a small, say a smaller B2B SaaS who wants to grow quickly, it'll integrate with something and then look to go through their sales channel. Shopify is a perfect sort of example of a marketplace led integration where it's like, I've built my integration. It does SMS. I'm in their marketplace, but also Shopify is taking me out and reselling me and making points on the back end for it. That's, that's a, you know, the, yeah. the shining star sort story over the last five years. So other, when you were going through this process with Zendesk, other than uh, realizing that some partners might not be the right fit for you because of the business model uh, or the pricing, were there any other problems that you faced? Challenges you had to overcome? Too many to list. <laughs> um, no, You're I, like, I think, no, no problems. Yeah, no, it was that simple, <laughs> that easy. Yeah. Um, no, it was fun, it was fun. I think the, the problem and challenge is always come back to in this space is that internal expectation um but also i think at the time we um we didn't have a we didn't have a large brand in the market and that was one of the biggest challenges again and this is like uh, as your audience you know depending on the size they are small large or whatever it is can um affiliate to it's as, as a company owner and founder and builder you think your company is large and it's but when you go out to these partners who have to invest and do stuff it's not seen as big as it is so i, I did have a challenge in terms yeah. of I work, for, I work for zendesk we're awesome we're great we're doing all this stuff and go out and speak to people like never heard of you i've got no idea who you are i know salesforce is i know service now is i know who these guys are so it's a lot around that side and also we were seeing the sort of a a cool company up and coming without all the functionality and enrichments that we needed. Um, so that definitely proved a challenge. And in the end, that that did mm -hmm. dictate the decision of going down the Google route because that market wasn't as mature in terms of the requirements that they needed. It was more open to yeah. taking some risk. Um, but yeah, this bit of gray hair here, this is, this is Zendesk gray. This is, yeah. <laughs> So what were the results or what have been the results? You said other than, of course, going to Malta next week and having drinks with all the friends that you made, but <laughs> I'm sure that there uh, were some some yeah, other we, pretty interesting results from this relationship. Definitely, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it was, I don't know, five years or more since I was working at Zendesk. I can't remember now, actually. I think it was about 2012, 2013 I started. And, and it was from a standing start of zero revenue, and a list of people that were apparently partners, but didn't even know they were when I contacted them. Um, now it's definitely in the, um, probably in the hundreds of millions. When I left, it was a $10 million part, uh, revenue part of the business. And that was just going across EMEA. So that was $10 million of new business each year coming through third party partners. That was the end result of those stressful activities to get those partners up and running. Um, with a structured partner program in place and contracts and marketing materials, training and enablement. And also that, that revenue that was coming through the channel was forecastable. That's the key word mm -hmm. is we could forecast through those marketing activities because we were also using a, a third party platform, what that revenue would be. So uh, the platform we used essentially had our marketing material in there that we use for direct partner could come in upload their contacts that we couldn't see it was you know we couldn't see that and then they click go and that camp those campaigns that we knew were successful would go out to their customers and then when i would do my uh, weekly sales review with them i could see how many had been open and then talk to them about leads so we could get into a forecast and that took sort of three years to get to that space but for me uh, when i left and came back to live live in the north I was happy that we had a structure, forecastable revenue and partners that were doing really well. And so as a final sort of success of that is um, we started to have partner councils. And that's when you bring your resellers into the company and they come and tell you what they could do better and come with marketing ideas mm -hmm. and campaign ideas. And they, But then what they do, they collaborate together. So um, the Google reseller we had in Israel, absolutely awesome at services so he would work with another partner across europe to deliver services while they did front-end graphics and stuff um so yeah 
yeah, it was really, uh, re well, I, I thought it was successful anyway. I was, I left happy. I've done my job. I've done what I needed to do. Um, hand it over. Excellent. Thanks, Stuart. This has been really interesting. I love this idea of collaborating with other partners, finding other ways to sell the product. Um, if people want to learn more about channel remarketing or learn more about you, what's the, where's the best place to connect with you? It's the best place you'll find, well, yeah. So you'll find me all over the place. I did used to wear flower shirts quite a lot. So I'm quite, uh, quite stick out a bit, but you'll find me at, um, channel of service.com. Um, I'll send you the link through for that. Um, and you'll find me on Twitter as Stuart Townsend. Come and say hello and always open to answering any questions around this. I've run sort of webinars on it every, every quarter or so, because it's just one of those areas that people don't quite understand. And when they get it, they see the value in it, but there's so many terminologies around. Yeah. I'll just help explain that. Um, but yeah, always happy to answer questions on it. Thanks. Uh, so whoever's watching or listening to this, please do connect with Stuart. Uh, if you liked the episode, please like it and leave a comment. Let us know that you watched it, share it with a friend or colleague. And that's it for today. Thanks for, thanks for being here, Stuart. Hey, no, thanks for the invite. And uh, I'll make sure I'll like it afterwards as well when it goes live. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. And that's the end of the podcast right there. Hope you enjoyed the episode, but please don't go just yet. If you did enjoy this episode, please leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It'll help other people like you discover us and get the same insights, and it would really help us out a lot. Um, thank you for being a loyal flying cat and for listening. See you next time. <laughs>